This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Talk about a challenge. Hey, what's it like opening two locations at the dawn of COVID? David Eschbach shares his story around three primary business tenants. Now, each takeaway is wrapped in a compelling story, and it's supported by integrating sub-lessons. Now, from the Aftermarket Radio Network, hi, it's Carm Capriato, here delivering your Aftermarket Business Acumen. Now, see the show notes as a guide for this episode, as this information is applicable for leading a business during any crisis or economic environment downturn, upturn, not just during covid Hey, thanks to our sponsors, Apex and Shopware, for providing this episode. You know, Apex 2022 will build upon the unique dedicated space for the service professional designated as Repair Shop HQ. Now, inside of Repair Shop HQ is Joe's Garage with 10 working bays and key aftermarket suppliers demonstrating their products and services. Hey, the training schedule is out. Please see it. It's incredible. I plan on being in on the Apex Action November 1st through the 3rd in Las Vegas. Register at aapexshow.com slash register. Don't forget to make hotel accommodations. aapexshow.com. Hey, do you want to grow your car count just a little higher? Sure, maybe you do. Or maybe you're just dreaming bigger and you want to open one more shop. Well, trust Shopware to provide the system that you've been waiting for to make that happen. On the web at GetShopware.com. Hey, welcome, aftermarketers from around North America and the world. It's amazing, David. I have, I have listeners all around the world. It's so cool. That's an accomplishment, Carm. David Eschbach is with us from Spirit One Automotive. Hello, David. Carm, how are you doing this afternoon? It's great to be here, sir. Good man. Uh, two location, multi shop owner, St. Louis. Out of St. Louis, Missouri. Yes. Mm-hmm. When was it the last time we got together and talked? I think the last time was close to about two and a half years. It was before COVID, so two and a half years ago. And then the first time we are flirting with five years ago. <laughs> so. <laughs> Who's crazy enough to want to open up shops during COVID? Well, I don't know if it was crazy or just really bad timing. <laughs> really bad timing. I've done shows with guys that, that tell the story of, oh, my God, we had the building, we had the loan, we had the lease, and it was signed, and then COVID hit. And, of course, we said, then what would you do next? And it, what's really interesting is that everyone that I have interviewed has, had, has a good story to tell. You went headstrong into this thing, and the thing I love about what you and I are going to talk about is, you know, these kind of, if you will, primary takeaways, these pillars, uh, you, you look back and he says, well, this is why I was able to make it work. You have to be a strong leader. You have to know and the value and the power of marketing. And you got to have decent health if you want to do all these things. Absolutely. And that that's what I found. <laughs> and so I can't wait to talk about this. So I think for everyone who's listening, this is going to be a great, real, live, honest to God success story being told in, if you will, three parts. Let's start with the characteristics of a strong leader. Let me step back a little bit. So when I came back to St. Louis, I saw opportunity. St. Louis like many other cities, has a big push of people to the outskirts uh, looking for the larger pastures. Uh, St. Louis being an older city has very strong urban neighborhoods, an urban fringe. And one thing that's happened is that as the people have left the city and pushed out for the bigger pastures, so has a lot of the retail. So when I wanted to open up a shop, I could go duke it out with some of the big 20 bay national shops out in suburbia, or I could find this opportunity and capture this opportunity, if you will, in the urban neighborhoods and become the neighborhood repair shop. And so that was my goal, three and four bay shops in urban neighborhoods. And that's where we started looking. The first shop we opened, like I said, was in October 2019. It was an abandoned gas station. It was built back in the 30s. It had been abandoned for about 25 years. It was just simply boarded up and forgotten. Is it neighborhood? Was it the fact that maybe the ground was contaminated? 
No, it was just the neighborhood itself. Retail is pushed out, even to go grocery shopping. So this is an old neighborhood called the Benton Park neighborhood, and it's shadowed by Anheuser-Busch. To even go grocery shopping, you have to leave the neighborhood and go out to the suburbs to really go to a large grocery store. Okay, help me understand one thing. You said the fringe, you said the fringe urban area. Is this more in, in, inner city or is this more closer to that fringe? This is this particular neighborhood it would be considered inner city higher middle class neighborhood. Um, But this particular plot of land was open. The guy was, there was just the right timing. We gutted it. We refinished the front. We did all the landscaping and put in a new parking lot and all that fun stuff. And to be honest with you, Carm, that one fired right off. We clumsily opened the doors at about eight o'clock on a Monday morning with plans on finishing up some remodeling because we still had some things to do. And the minute the doors opened, the cars started coming in. We were provided that gift of consumer need. And and I'm going to back up a little bit because I'm going to refer back to this. There are five stages that every business goes through, and it doesn't matter what kind of business you are. And those stages are obscurity. No one knows who you are. There's awareness. They see your sign. They know you're there. There's need. That means they have a need for what you offer. And then there's change. That's a tough one. That's when they're going to make the change and come back and and come see you. And then ultimately there's recommend. And that's the referral business with your influencers. So we were given that gift of awareness because people were watching us redo this building. So, I mean, it just blew up. I mean, we right out of the gate, we were just, we never knew a bad day at that location. Isn't it cool when, when people drive by or they walk by and they say, what's this going to be? What are you doing here? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was, it was, I was planting flowers at like 10 o'clock one night and these, these people pulled up and said, we've been watching you and you know, is this really an auto repair shop? And, and it's like, yes, it is. And it was really interesting um, to see the neighborhood come into that. What a thrill at eight o'clock on the day you opened that uh, people wanted to come in and partake of your services. The excitement, the support, and I do, this is part of the success. We've on the Nextdoor app, we are, we have been the the Nextdoor favorite for the last two years that we've been down there. So they've really, the the, the community has stepped behind us. Um, So we had that up and going and then came Afton. Now Afton is a, technically is a uh, county or suburban neighborhood. It sits right on the fringe. It borders the city line. And we opened that in February, 2020. I knew this was going to be a little tougher. Afton is a very old neighborhood. It's St. Louis's not oldest non-city neighborhood. And it's a strong and proud community, working class people who have loyalty. But a lot of their loyalty was within the eight shops that surround us. And some of those shops have been there for over 50 years. So we had our work cut out for us. But I had a little bit of blind faith. And to be honest with you, Carm, I was a little drunk with courage uh, from our <laughs> first that. location yeah. to immediate takeoff. I mean, we were intoxicated with success. There was no doubt about it. Let's remind the audience, you said February of 2020. And of course, the world shut down in March, right? And that's what we were facing. Yeah, we walked in there with a swagger. We had uh, the road that went out front, that passed out front, hosted over 10,000 cars a day coming in and out of the city. Great community. I was from that south part of St. Louis, so I had some real, you know, good contacts. Killed it with traditional advertising. We did what we could to the outside of the building because it was still winter time. And when we opened, Carm, we opened to the fanfare of a of an abandoned carnival. We opened to nothing. Uh, We knew it was going to be tough, but we didn't know how tough. It was a whoops moment. It was a whoops moment. It was a, uh uh-oh. And I knew it would be a little tough. And so I wasn't discouraged. And then, you know, then someone sneezed in the East. And the next thing we know, our world was changed. And it was changed permanently. And it's, we still feel the permanent change from it's from, you know, from that initial outbreak of the virus. Really? Even to today? I think we have. I mean, I think people say we're back to normal, but we're not back to 2019 normal. I think it's a new normal. Um, Opinions, viewpoints, working and living habits have all changed. I don't know what city is back to full 100% traffic. I think people became accustomed to working from home and and maybe one car families. And even if they keep two cars in a two car family, are they going to put the kind of miles on them? So you're starting up in a neighborhood where there's legacy people there for 50 years and you're trying to make a statement. 
Absolutely. We're trying to break out and all of a sudden we, we get news of a virus. And, and Carmine can remember this. It was a cold, cloudy day and that just it was just one of those blah days and that even made the news more grim. But we had been hearing about this virus in Europe. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're thinking to ourselves, that's Europe. You know, they take five hour lunch breaks and we're speedos to the beach. You know, that's those guys. That's let them do what they want to do. But then all of a sudden, now they're talking about Washington State and the West Coast. And now you've realized that COVID had entered our proverbial home. Now, I do want to make a quick pause on this, Carm, because I do know that a lot of shops had great years that during the pandemic. Now, in the beginning, I think there was a ripple effect that hurt a lot of people for the first, let's call it maybe 30, 45 days, maybe 60 days. But then a lot of shops experienced great years because, well, let's face it, people had free time and they had free money from the government. With And so you've got free time and money. That's perfect combination for auto repair and maintenance. But if you remember those five stages of the business I discussed earlier, we were still in the obscurity stage. And, you know, you can have the brightest sign out in front of your shop, but if everyone is locked down in quarantine, no one sees it. And so that's where we were at. And no one cared about automotive service for those first 30 to 45 days. They were, they were wondering where their next toilet paper purchase was going to come from. Exactly. And that was the thing is where were we going to buy toilet paper and and where can I sign up for my Netflix app so I can binge watch something? You know, our ideal working class demographic, they were hunkered down. I mean, lockdowns, quarantines, curfews. Once again, go back and think about this. We're the United States of America. Go see the USA in your Chevrolet, but you can't do it today because we're giving you orders to be locked down, quarantined, and we're giving you curfews. Think about that. Think about that in our own country. I mean, think about how ridiculous it was. You know, you put your heart and soul into your work every day, but the automotive aftermarket, it moves fast and staying competitive means staying up to date on the very latest training, new systems and new products. At Apex, the Automotive Aftermarket Product Expo, Repair Shop HQ is dedicated to the service professional and is committed to pulling together some of the best training sessions to grow your technical and your business knowledge. The training is especially for technicians, service advisors, and owners. And inside of Repair Shop HQ is Joe's Garage. Now, Joe's Garage is set up with 10 bays and working lifts to demonstrate new equipment and the latest technology. Besides the latest tools and equipment, discover the newest in management and marketing tools and dedicated sections for tires, alternative fuels, diagnostics, and telematics. If you experienced Repair Shop HQ last year, you'll get even more in 2022. Hey, listen here for the latest information on Apex 2022, November 1st through the 3rd. Write that down. And for more information, visit aapexshow.com. Now, housing is already open. And registration will open May 2nd. Visit aapexshow.com. Nothing tells a customer that they need a new part faster than when they see a worn or a broken one in their hands. How do you do that in the digital age? Well, it's easy. Thanks to DVX, you can send photos and videos within its messenger platform. It's like nothing else you've seen in an auto repair SMS before. Take the best of an Amazon-like experience and use it in your shop to show customers how great you are. DVX also makes it easy for customers to drop you a quick text or answer in the messenger bubble that arises from the repair order. It's like magic. Customers love seeing what they need to do and giving you a quick answer. You'll see your business potential right in front of you. Your customers get on with their day and you get back to the repair. Everybody wins. It's time. GetShopware.com. You're bringing up all these emotions, maybe, that that's what we'll call them, that we didn't know what was around the next corner, and we were all adapting or adopting to what we think was going to be, oh, just a short-term inconvenience. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, think about all the businesses that had money on the line that started up. So that's why I, I find this to be a fascinating story. Well, and you're exactly right. And I think in the beginning, it was kind of that fun break from reality type of deal. Hey, my boss is letting me work from home and I can play around all day. It was kind of a weird vacation, if you will. It was a break from reality. I do remember a little bit, I really snapped at this young police officer 
I was driving home one night from work and I was filling up with gas and he actually asked, he actually informed me that there was a quarantine in that community. And what was I doing? And I snapped at the, He was a young guy and I snapped at him. I was tired. I was, I, and I snapped at him and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, essential worker. I own a, sh- a business. I'm trying to keep it alive. And I think he saw my temperament and kind of said, yes, sir. And just kind of went along his way. And I still feel bad to this day because I, because I don't know if he knew what he was doing in the same sense. So, <laughs> but I mean, that's what we were at. It was kind of about that time when that police officer did that. I really thought back to when I lived in Houston and Hurricane Ike was headed our way. For three days prior to landfall, not one news report said anything about simply waiting for the storm. Every headline, tagline, byline, they all said, prepare for the storm. I remember pumping the gas that evening and saying, I got to prepare for this. So I took a day in my office and I stepped away from my shops. And this is kind of a micro lesson, Carm. Working on your business means stepping away from your business. And I always prescribe no less than three days a month out of your shop so you can clearly think and create and implement new ideas. Even if you're the owner slash lead technician, just get away from the shop during a weekday. It can't be during a weekend, during a weekday and really plan and work on the growth of your shop. It's healthy. I don't do that enough, but when I do travel to local meetings, uh, I never fail to have my mind go in, and you know, as fast as the car's driving, so is my mind going, and and I find it very cathartic when I'm alone in the vehicle driving, because I'm I'm a multi-purpose guy, so you know, I my subconscious can drive the car while my brain power is working somewhere else. It gives you that time to just just escape and and create and organize. And so I did. I stepped away, but my first priority was keeping my team. I had worked really, really hard to build this team. And like I said before, there was an initial ripple to business, but a lot of shops started to do well. Now, I'm going to share something with you, Carmen. I, you might want to censor this out of the podcast because I don't know if we want too many people knowing this, but there's a tech shortage out there. Don't really? tell anybody. Yeah, this is just, just, let's just keep it between us. Um, I won't breathe another word. <laughs> and um, with this tech shortage, uh, I had a team that was a good team and other shops were, you know, I knew they would kind of get back on their feet a little bit faster and I needed to keep them. Rule number one is we know pay is not the reason people leave, but they do like to be paid. But what I focused on was this was a time of uncertainty and not even our elected officials could give us clear visions and clear guidance. And I didn't want that to trickle down and have my team lose confidence in me. So action plan one, Carm, become a great leader. Okay. Action plan two, figure out how to come become a great leader. Uh, I just can't say that to the reflection in the mirror. It's not going to work. So I did a lot of research. And as you know, I think we're flooded with quotes and memes and books and pamphlets telling us what it means to be a great leader. But the truth is that leadership begins with awareness. And awareness of our message is priority number one. We don't hear, and I mean critically hear, what comes out of our mouths. Trust me, I'll listen to this podcast and I'll hear many things that make me think, man, that wasn't clear. I didn't hit the mark. I mean, you really have a luxury to do what you do for a profession because you get to hear yourself time and time again and continue to improve upon that. Thank you for saying that. Uh, Just as a side note to my audience, I'm not sure they know this. uh, I listen to every final produced episode. It's it's a requirement of mine. Even if I did the interview a month ago, or even if it's someone in my network, I listen to every one of them. There's a reason. Was it quality? Was it content? How was the production? But to learn new things, I'm learning and picking up ideas for future shows based on dialogue that I had with someone like, right, I'm enjoying this conversation, but I will probably enjoy it even more when I listen to it again. And I listen uh, to really learn. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, What you're saying is when you're up in front of your people and you're leading and you are laying out whatever it is, building your culture, building up your people, building up your clients, it's important to rewind the day and say, did you make sense that day? Did your people, what did your people hear? Absolutely. And another little side note, coaching your team, I always recommend recording yourself when you talk to customers. And that's, that's a great benefit of recording yourself to talking to customers. It's the same way as you know, you get to do, you were recording yourself. And that's what I mean about really hearing what comes out of your mouth because our 
messages, they're amplified to the proverbial number 11 here. And, and what I mean is every message that we deliver as a leader, every message that we deliver to our team member is also delivered to their family. And that's what makes it go to 11. Don't ever, ever devalue or, or take away the power from the, of the power of the dinner table. The dinner table is where your message is delivered to the spouse. And it's the conversations between your team member and the spouse that define a workplace happiness and longevity and loyalty. Amen. So let me run that back through the airwaves. Any message you deliver is delivered again across the dinner table. Anything, no matter how rehearsed or how flippant. And this is another top podcast topic, but the spouse situates themselves as the third party evaluator. They look at the situation from the outside in. They're almost like that outside consultant who comes into the business. And for some reason, the boss listens to that consultant. But the consultant was telling the, the boss the same thing the employees were telling the boss for years. <laughs> That's their credibility. And if you ever had a technician come in out of nowhere and say, hey, I want more pay, I want more days off, or I think I deserve this, that's the product of a dinner table discussion. So everything you say goes over that dinner table. In fact, and this is a little bit of an off-topic thing, in fact, if you're doing employee reviews with only the employee, you're wasting your time. The review has to be modified a bit, but it must become a conversation at dinner with the employee and their spouse make it an event. Take them both to dinner, include the spouse, and you'll create a bond stronger than Gorilla Glue. Some very big strategies on hiring is to be sure the spouse is is involved in one stage of, of the interview process. And usually it's it's at dinner and you're speaking to the spouse mostly because the spouse will make the difference in that individual coming to work for you. Uh, so to do a review with the spouse, it's it's a genius idea. Well, and you do have to redefine the review a little bit, but it, it's definitely, for instance, tomorrow night, I'm taking a lead technician and a spouse out to dinner and we're going to talk about growth and it's bringing them back to the table. Like you said, interviewing, it's a must, um, but review, I also think it's a must. Also, you can deliver the right message to the spouse. And this just kind of came from this morning. I was listening to your episode with Bob Cooper at Vision 2022. Side note here. Sherry's legacy with what she's done with Mwaka is just amazing for the industry. Mm -hmm. Her legacy will be legend. But I was also listening to your podcast because of Cooper and Cooper's a legend. And he's the best at what he does. So anytime he speaks, I listen. And he summed it up a lot more precise and a lot easier than what I'm doing it. But he said, no one works for me. They work with me. And that's a great way to convey that message when you're out to dinner with your team member doing that review or discussing things with them. So I'm going to come back to my building point here. At that point, I couldn't take them out to dinner pod, because we were in lockdowns and so forth. So my first objective was to deliver very simple messages. I wanted messages to be delivered that they couldn't be misinterpreted and, and especially messages with little or no emotional fuel. And I'll talk about that in a second. So I focused on little victories. Hey guys, we had five cars today. And guess what? None of them were personal friends or personal references. They were all unknown customers giving us a try and supporting our new business. Little easy to explain victories. I would look for acts of autonomy within the shop from the guys. In fact, we created a shelving system for our parts that one guy brought to the table and it worked and it made sense. And that was a home run. Because I didn't know this, but never before has any owner allowed him to create and implement something. And that was worth more than its weight in gold. So my goal, and this is a goal far prior to COVID, but my goal was and is to empower the team member. Empowerment comes in many forms, but placing trust in their word and their opinion and vision, and that's a great place to start. That's why I never ran any of our meetings back then, and I still don't. They run them. Um, I'm the note taker during the meetings. So that was part of my goal is during this dark time, I want them finding a light of having a choice, having a voice, building self-respect and identifying their own victories, even if they are simple little victories. I would do everything I could to find a victory and sometimes create a victory every single day. Because when you think about it, when workers gather at the bar or the happy hour or an outside work event, what do people do? They complain. 
People love to complain about work. They complain about the business, the boss, the decisions, and the quirks of all the other workers. And if you're not careful, that complaining can really become a firestorm. So my goal was to influence mental habit by focusing on victories. And then all of a sudden, the discussion became about victories. But you have to find victories every day, and that's hard. But being a leader isn't easy. You got to create this stuff. You just can't let it happen around you. Because if you do, uh, to your point, we we love to talk about bad news, it seems. Mm Mm-hmm. Go eavesdrop on a group of people at a happy hour. doesn't matter what industry. I don't care who they are. But once they start talking about work, they start complaining about work. And it's an easy thing to do. And, And that was really one of my things. I couldn't have that in my team. We had to talk about the victories of the day. It had to have an absence of emotion. And I really wanted to find that for a moment because, Carm, I'll be honest with you. I was dying inside. 50 years old, three kids, a wife. I'm self-funding this excursion. My checking account looked like something out of a Wes Craven movie. I mean, it was bleeding money at a rate that would make our national deficit feel good. And remember, I was too young for PPP money. And the banks weren't real excited about funding a startup business in the middle of a pandemic. Every evening, I made the drive home, 30-minute drive home in silence and just simply ravaging through my mental playbook a, like a jewelry store thief, I picked through every practice I had ever preached, every theory I had prescribed, and every trick up my sleeve. And I kept thinking to myself, what have I done in the past? What have I been taught? What I, how can I combine what I've been done and, how can I, and what I've taught? How can I even look at some of the things I've discredited before, some of the theories that I've discredited? I just couldn't wrap this up. I was stuck. At one point in time, I told my wife, I I said, I feel like a rat in a trap because where was I going to go? So I had to ride the storm out and I had to keep my team and I had to keep them productive. And I couldn't allow that emotion to define me. Did you grow as a leader because you got into that zone, if you will, of trying to uh, flip over every rock? Yes, I can honestly say that as a leader, as a coach, as a voice, I will say that I'm 110% different than I was three years ago because I truly felt the trap. It's that fight or flight. I didn't have anywhere to flight. <laughs> so, and remember, that was the very first thing. I couldn't let that emotion of, holy crap, I'm dying to fuel the already scared emotional status of our team members and their spouses. It just couldn't be done. One of the great rules I've learned was from Horace Schultz. He's the CEO of Ritz Carlton Hotels, or was. But he was once said, as a leader, we forfeit the right to emotion. We can't allow emotion to define us. And a great way to do this is simply guarantee reaching your goal. And he said, I'll show you, you know, show me a champion who doesn't guarantee reaching their goal, and I'll show you a guy who isn't a champion. And I think that's a trait of a lot of great leaders. Know your goal and know you will achieve your goal. So instead of simply writing the goal, write the date it'll be achieved. And that's something I did with my team. We set these hardcore goals that come heck or high water, we would reach. Another thing that I kept thinking about through this, and I don't know if you remember the movie Shawshank Redemption. Mm -hmm. Andy Dufresne, he crawled through a pipe of human waste for 500 yards to reach his escape. He knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel, but he couldn't see it. And there's no difference. What also defines a leader is how they conduct themselves while in what I call the pipe of crap. And no matter how hard that journey is, it's how we conduct ourselves. We're not allowed to throw tools, discipline an individual while the group watches or yell. We are not allowed to allow emotion to enter our worlds. And neither should the leaders of your shop. And I'm going to kind of repeat that again. We're not allowed to do that. And that's common knowledge. But neither should the leaders of your shop. And this was another step of mine to implement. I don't care if it's the best tech, if it's a shop foreman, if it's the guy who started with you. Any leader, regardless of their tenure or value, they must abide by this leadership rule. And it's our goal to get them there. And that is unconditional. And and the reason why I pound on this is because a lot of us have strong technicians, have strong leaders, and we allow them a little latitude when emotion takes over. That was one of the lessons I learned, Carm, is 
you cannot allow that. In fact, you know, I will put my money where my mouth is. The gentleman who started with me always had a problem with emotion and I had to dismiss him because that was not going to be allowed in the shop if we were going to grow. I do kind of want to do a big stopping point here and say, hey, David's preaching, preaching not to show emotion. And many people knee jerk to saying that's just cold, heartless corporation cardboard type of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about practicing compassion, but there is a big difference between compassion and emotion. And trust me, this was tough for me, Karn, because I've never been a guy to throw tools or big tantrums, but I did have a tendency to, and I do have a tendency to spit a little fire and I had to suppress those sparks. I had to suppress them because the turbulence of COVID was truly getting to me. Uh, if I can, I'd like to share a little story with you. I call it the rule of Gladys. One evening, I was flying out of Brownsville, Texas, when I lived in Houston. And if you've ever flown from the valley, there's wind. It's always turbulent because there's winds that come off the ocean and so forth. This evening, there was a storm coming in, so it was exceptionally turbulent. And and I'm not a plane guy. I don't know. It was a plane with, there was like 12 of us on there, two pilots, one flight attendant, and the thing had two props, so like a turboprop plane. And the flight attendant was Gladys. Gladys wasn't a day south of 70, and she let you know it. Gladys had the comedic uh, political correctness of a football locker room. Um, <laughs> and that was her thing. Um, but she knew her audience. Um, and I'll even go as far to tell you the, what really broke the ice with her is the pilot said, okay, gentlemen, we will have a lot of turbulence. This is going to be bumpy when we take off. And for the probably the first 20 minutes of flight, it's going to be real bumpy. And the pilot goes, Gladys, you know, find yourself a seat and get buckled in. And Gladys looked around and said, okay, who's lapping? I'm, am I sitting on? Because I'm not letting an opportunity pass me by. So, I mean, this is who Gladys was. And for the the entire flight, she kept us going. I mean, we were laughing. We were just shooting stuff back and forth, and she kept us going. And, of course, the flight smoothed out, and we landed in Houston. I got off the plane in Houston Hobby, and Houston Hobby is a small airport. And, and I walked outside, and sure enough, leaning against the trunk of her car, smoking a Virginia Slim, is Gladys. And I said, hey, Gladys, uh, thanks again. Appreciate everything you did. I said, I guess that's just one of many flights uh, that had a few bumps in it. She said, no, that was a bad flight. And uh, I said, really? She goes, that was, that was a really bad flight. She goes, I didn't like that at all. And I said, well, remind me never to play poker against you, Gladys. I said, how do you do it? And she looked at me and I'm going to substitute a word here, Carm, because she didn't use this word. So I'm going to use the word crap, but she used another word. Looked me dead in the eye while she's smoking this Virginia Slim. And she goes, listen, she goes, on a flight like that, more than likely you're going to lose your crap but you're really going to lose your crap if I lose my crap. So if I don't lose my crap, it's less likely that you're going to not lose your crap. So my job is to not lose my crap so you don't lose your crap. Does that make sense? I said, Gladys, it makes all the sense in the world. Boy, there's a leadership lesson. <laughs> so from that point, during the times of the most turbulence, I've had to revert back to the rule of Gladys with my team. I love it. Because they see... You know, a lot of people who are scared to fly, they say they always look at the, for the oldest flight attendant. And if they're freaked out, then then it's bad. If they see me freak out, then they know something's bad. So you have to maintain a front. And that's what I mean by the lack of emotion. I've also say it's a little lonely at the top. And I don't say top as a I say it as a catchphrase, not as a defining factor here. We're not allowed to share our, uh, our tales of woe with the group. We're not allowed to complain. But it does feel good to complain. But we can't do this because it really serves no purpose. It translates horribly over the dinner table and it does signal weakness. Plan A is executed, Carm. I've embraced, I think, the good character, the characteristics of a good leader. I'm looking for those daily victories to empower my team. I'm enacting compassion and eliminating emotion. And I'm being like Gladys. So now what? We're essential workers with no essential customers. And we all know the truth about marketing. And the truth is that marketing doesn't produce overnight results. And we have marketing, advertising, and branding. And that's all long game plan. But you have to do it every day. No matter what's going on in that day, no matter if you're slow or if you're booked out years ahead, you promote every single day, at least one thing a day. And that's something we can't let slip in one ear hole and out the other. One thing per day we have to do. And I learned this as a sales manager with an engine manufacturer in Texas. I had just moved to Houston, Texas in 2008. I just moved there with my family. And what happened in 08? 
housing bubble, cash for clunkers, horrible recession. And I'm down there selling a premium price product in a market that we were largely obscure. And that wasn't good at all. Nothing good about it. But I learned a lesson while I was down there. I learned that there is light at the end of the pipe. Even though I couldn't see it, I knew there had to be light. In fact, every pipe, no matter how long, long it may feel or how much crap is flowing through it, every pipe has an end to it. Do the right thing every day and do it without influence of the world. That's what I was taught when I was down there. Do it with blind faith and it will result in achievement. And back in 08 and 09, I did discover success. Now, Carm, I found myself doing engine clinics and catering lunch at 3 a.m. to third shift workers, but I had to do what I had to do. I had to find the end of that crap pipe. Now, note to vendors out there, if you're not seeing third shift workers, you're not owning your territory because there's a lot of the world that operates at late at night. So in 2020, I went back to my experiences in Houston and implemented what's what I call the once a day method. We were already strong on social media. I really learned how to use Facebook and Nextdoor, and that's still our stronger attractor of business. In fact, Nextdoor is responsible for about 90% of our business at my Benton Park location. Wow. We're not so strong on Twitter because I was the kind of thinking who's going to follow us, but I really have to rethink that. And TikTok hadn't truly busted out into the scene, but we're starting to use TikTok now. Of course, traditional mailers, and believe it or not, we invested heavy in print ad because people were at home and they were reading again. It was weird. You saw print ad uh, publications go up in, in subscriptions. I also carried a marketing kit with me in my truck. It was a little bag. It was little pens, scratch pads, card, all in this little bag. So if you were filling up with gas and you were a plumber or electrician or some type of service van, you and I were making a conversation. Everybody out there was a prospect. I didn't say customer, but everybody was a prospect. That's guerrilla marketing, David. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, I was literally out on the streets beating the bricks, looking for people. My once a day method was doing that. Now, marketing was the umbrella really for advertising and branding. One thing I do suggest that I think is a great thing to do, and I, and I think it'll help a lot of people truly learn the definitions of marketing, advertising, and branding understand what those are because I think it'll make this next step a little easier when you when you implement this. The first thing that I had to do is make a comprehensive list of marketing efforts. What do I want to market? Where do I want to market? Who do I want to market? Promotions, outreach, charitable, any way to touch somebody. Make this massive comprehensive list. And I think everybody should be doing this. And you can't do, do it at just one sitting. This takes a while. And like you said, Carm, driving down the road, if you get an idea, boom, record it somehow and just put it on this list and make a massive marketing list of how your business can touch somebody else in any way, shape, or form. And then create a schedule. Create a schedule by using a calendar program um, or creating a calendar and do one thing every day. But when I've worked with shops in the past, I've run into two conundrums doing this. The one was, hey, I've got too much business. We're booked 20 weeks out. I've got one word for you, Carm. Coca-Cola. Largest advertiser, and they have the largest market share. Why? Because someday you might get thirsty. No different with our customers. Um, we know our customers may not need us for three to four months. They need to be touched no matter how busy you are today. It's opportunity marketing because you never know when the opportunity comes. That is absolutely it. We have to stay in front of them. Um, another thing that I've run into too, and I ran into this myself, is I was speaking with a mailing company and they wanted a $5,000 commitment. And that was a lot of money for me. Still is. I didn't have 5000 to dump into, mail, into mailers. And one thing I have noticed is fiscal commitments that are too large or contractual obligations that are too big cause a lot of business owners to simply scrap the entire idea totally. I guess it's like the baby in the bathwater scenario. They just get it out completely. But you have to look at other ways around it. And I thought to myself, I could spend a couple hundred dollars per week doing this. Now, it's not as fast and as abrupt, but at least it's movement forward. And I used Vistaprint. I designed a few postcards and I used their mailing addresses and did a couple hundred a byte. And I learned how to really kind of hone their process to fit mine. But I learned something through this. Oil change specials, tire discounts, and 10% off services weren't working. They weren't attracting customers. It didn't matter, Carm, if it was social media, print ad, or what. Uh, traditional advertising was not working in my shop. 
coupons and discounts, we all know, is just a way to say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, I want your money. I'm willing to take less of it if you use this discount, but I still want your money. And that type of advertising wasn't what I needed to be doing at the time. It was simply the wrong type of advertising because we were still in a stage of obscurity. And in a time when no one is certain about anything, no one is going to make a change because a stranger, that's me, because a stranger is asking for money, even if it is a little less money. So I was spending money on advertising I didn't have, and that had to stop. So I had to go back to the drawing board. And I remember this. This was an epiphany. It was unseasonably cool morning that morning, and the shop was just crazy, deathly quiet. Nothing was happening. The phone wasn't ringing. There were no cars in the shop. In fact, that avenue of 10,000 cars was nothing more than a desolate asphalt path you know, leading to an empty city at this point in time. To keep the shop occupied that morning, I ins- did an instructional, instructional time on setting up a Roth IRA. Um, and helping the guys manage it. I, I was doing anything I could to occupy time and create victories. So when we were done doing that, I walked out to the shop. My golf bag was sitting next to my truck. I grabbed a driver, a tee, and a ball, and I walked out to this four-lane road in front of my shop. Standing in the middle of the lane, the actual fifth lane, I wedged a tee into the crack of the asphalt and, and from my tee box in the street, I could see the St. Louis Arch. I could see the buildings of the skyline. Now, I couldn't see in them, but boy, you could feel the emptiness. Teed up and with a firm and gentle grip, left arm straight, head down, wrist rolling. I knocked that ball and the sound of the club came off, you know, the, the sound of the ball off the club head echoed for miles. It was a perfect drive. I almost had t-shirts printed at this point, Carm. It was a perfect drive right down four-lane road. 325 yards in the air. Must have been 325 yards. Oh, it had to be if it was 400. (laughs) Another 150 (laughs) yards through three lighted intersections bounced by golf ball. It bounced and it rolled out of sight. And all the while, it never came into contact or disrupted the path of a car, truck, bicycle, motorcycle, tricycle, or person. And that's when it hit me. That's when my marketing epiphany hit me. Carm, there was no one out driving. The world was quiet. And I was doing something once, at least once a day, marketing-wise, but I wasn't doing the right thing. I was doing the wrong thing. And while I was standing there, you look into the city, and I was thinking of my other shop down in the city... And how it's shadowed by Anheuser-Busch in a book I read about Anheuser-Busch, about the rise and the fall of Anheuser-Busch called Bitter Brew. And back in the 30s, back in the Depression era, Anheuser-Busch for two years, they took their advertising money and invested it in searching for jobs and advertising for um, getting people working. They didn't advertise their product. They put it into other programs because their thought process was, if you don't have a job, you don't have money, you can't buy beer. But if you do have a job, nothing's better than after a hard day's work, buying a nice cold beer. So my thought process went in the same direction. Now, granted, I don't have the influence of Anheuser-Busch, but I changed the topics of my social media posts, my mailers, and my print ads. I started talking about experiences. I started talking about experiences of living again while driving your car. One of the very first things I did is I put a post out there about driving to Elephant Rock State Park, and it's in southern Missouri, and it's this big state park with the big granite rock formations down there. And I talked about my wife and I driving down there into the into the scenic through the scenic roads. And then my next post was about a Sunday evening. My wife and I took a drive down the Great Alton River Road, which is a road that has the Mississippi and Missouri on one side and these beautiful bluffs to the to the other side of you. And I said, we were bored on a Sunday night, so we dropped the top and took off down for a drive down the Great Alton River Road. I wasn't asking for money or even discounted money at this point. I was sharing experience and living again of living again, while, of course, driving your car. And, of course, there was a little subtle call to action ingrained in every story and informational piece that I would put out there. And believe it or not, they began to come. We even had customers who would stop into the shop to share pictures of adventures they took that weekend or that day and pictures we shared on social media. And it was actually working. We were, we think we were getting people in their cars that had a need for their car. And we started to see some of the things that they needed, the oil change, brakes, things like that, because now they were venturing off to these state parks and these, these places they could go and be outside and no longer quarantined. But Garm, we had yet to experience our biggest success, and that came in the form of a big red dog. 
we got a Clifford the Big Red Dog outfit. And it was a genuine outfit. And I put it on and I started parading around the front of the shops, waving at everybody that would drive by, you know, even if it was a dozen people. But I would go out there every single day and wave at people in that Clifford outfit. And, and it was funny. One guy would flip us off every day when he was driving to work or somewhere every day. So I made it a point to be out there when he drove by. And one day he flipped us off with both hands. And that was a victory in our shop right there. We, that's the reaction we got out of him. But this was the deal. We were a few months into the lockdown at this point. And people had binge watched everything and they were getting bored. But most importantly, kids were getting cabin fever. So what we did is we did a come take your picture with Clifford, no contact. So what you would do is you would pull up. We had a whiteboard that we had. We wrote our telephone number, our cell phone number on. You text us your name. We would take a picture of Clifford standing outside the car window with your your child and they're waving and so forth. And we would text you the picture. So now we had your name and your number and we had a great text campaign and that proved crazy successful. But that's when I learned something. I learned that success is detrimental to your daily efforts, if not more detrimental than failure. That's why the once a day method is so important here. See, we were coming off a high. Customers were coming in. Clifford was killing it. And what do we see as viewers, when we see a team win the championship or we see somebody take home the gold, we see them go to Disney World. We see them relax. We see them take a well-deserved break. But that doesn't work in the small business world. A triumph only means your next effort has to produce bigger results. And that's why the once a day method's got to be done ritually. So as a leader, I I was seeking daily victories to maintain morale and build team strength and build pride. Victories in sale, your sales goals, your profit goals, or head uh, everything. Count? Victories from everything from sales to car count to this technician or this person did this. Everything was a victory. And that is one thing that I had to be a little careful of. I could not tie victory solely to revenue because we weren't seeing a lot of revenue. So I really had to find other sources of victories, if you will. But if you remember from the beginning, I promised three takeaways here. And now the hardest part was me. I learned a really valuable lesson here, regardless the size of your business. And I don't care how defined or accurate your succession plan is or how many layers of ownership you have. The true health of your business is your health as an owner, was my health. So first things first, Carm. I'm not in any position to physically train anyone. This section, I truly failed 100% F. Throughout the past two years, I've let my healthy habits simply disappear. I haven't eaten well. I haven't seen the inside of a gym. And I haven't taken care of me. And most unfortunately, I've reignited a few bad habits. One of them was smoking. I was a past smoker for years. And then about two years ago... I started to use it as a crutch. Now, I never bought a pack. I'm going to ask any recovering smoker, and they never do. They always have a supply line from somewhere. (laughs) You're you're describing me when I quit and then I came back and I smoked other people's cigarettes. But I will tell you, I have been, I have not had a cigarette in 32 years, David. The way you feel without smoking, it's just 10 times better than when you did. But I was looking for that comfort. You know, everybody, when everybody would leave the shop at the end of the day and it was quiet in the shop, I could walk through the shop and smoke and it helped me philosophize. But it didn't because the truth of it all is you can't think clearly when your arteries are constricting. And I wasn't working out because I didn't have time. I would work in my office until noon on a Sunday. And then I would sit around all afternoon to relax. I wasn't looking for ways to relax, like working out or even taking a walk. Now, I mentioned my family, Carm. I've got a wife and three kids. And of the three, I have a six-year-old. I'm 50. He's six. Do the math. He's our little whoops a baby. But I say that with love because he's, he's really a cool guy. And I mean, him and I are like buddies. And one would think that an epiphany of my health would come as I looked into the eyes of my six-year-old thinking, how can I be with you as long as humanly possible? But the epiphany didn't come from that. The epiphany came from an off-the-cuff comment from my towing dispatcher. My towing dispatcher, Dave, 
is about 6'1 and about 400 pounds. He's a guy you wouldn't want to owe money to until you got to know him. And then you realize his heart's the size of his frame. So one day, Carmen, it was like, I was getting a little frustrated and we share an office at the, the Afton slash Crabboy location. And, and I was getting a little frustrated and I said, Dave, I'm going out and I'm going to just step into traffic and let it all go. I said, but the problem is it's going to take four hours to get hit because there's no traffic outside. And as I was walking out of the office, he said, you can't do that. And I go, why? And he said, because you've got too many people counting on you and I still don't own a boat. And that was the epiphany. And I'll circle, I'll circle back to the boat comment. <laughs> our team is counting on us, not only for our decisions, but our best decisions. And those can't come without being in good physical condition. And I know this phrase has been bastardized so much throughout the last two years, but there's simply too much science that proves the health of the body accompanies the health of the mind. One thing per day, it can be a walk, it can be a light workout, it can be stretching and push-ups, but simply one thing a day. Like I said, I'm not a personal trainer, but there are many programs out there. And for the record, I haven't smoked for quite some time now. But through this poorly timed adventure, (laughs) I've had my best ideas, my best theories, my best practices put to the test. And I've been tested and challenged to become a good leader, and I've been tested and challenged to become a good marketer of my brand. I've been reminded my body is no longer 25 and 50 ain't that old. So I have to take care of myself. Ultimately, I realized Dave, my dispatcher, Dave, remember him? Dave doesn't own a boat. And this is what it all means. Leadership, marketing, health, it all boils down to Dave not owning a boat. And I'll explain that. When you join my team, I share a story with you. And it's a story about when I was this boy, my dad and I would go out on a summer evening and we would go to this lake that led off of the, the, the river, the Merrimack River, there's a park called George Winter Park in Fenton. And we would sit on this big rock and we would watch the people in their boats. They would ski and then they would bring in the boats and they would put them on the trailers. And being from a mechanical, you know, kind of an aptitude or enjoyment, if you will, I liked, I liked watching them put the boats on the trailers. And then I would watch, you know, the, the, station wagons spin the tires up the boat path to, to get the boat out of the water. This, keep in mind, Carmen, this is the middle of the, the mid seventies. This was these were station wagons, not SUVs with traction control. And we would watch this and we would often talk about getting a boat one day. And I didn't really realize that, but he knew that wouldn't come true. I mean, I didn't grow up poor, but not wealthy. And I didn't grow up without, but we certainly didn't have with. Um, but we knew that and he knew that we would never get that boat. So when I talk to my new team members, I'll tell them that my goal is I want you and your family to be the ones in the boat. And that's my goal. I'll tell that new team member, I will do everything in my power to empower you and your family. I will help push coach and have compassion for everything you do and everything you are. That's my promise to you. The rest is up to you. And that's why the once a day method is so important, because if I do the right thing, my team can discover strengths and accomplishments they've never imagined. But if I fail to hone my skills and if I fail to avoid, if I avoid testing and challenging myself in ways that make me uncomfortable, then in return, my team doesn't experience great things. And if they don't know the feeling of experiencing great things, then they can't, I can't expect them to provide a great experience for my customers. And it all goes hand in hand. COVID was a great experience for me as a professional. And although I don't want to relive it, (laughs) it taught me a lot. And I can only hope by sharing some of my experiences, maybe someone else out there just starting a shop or experiencing some hard times can help reach their goals. So right now we have two shops that are doing fairly well. I'm happy with, we are in expansion mode again. And, you know, hopefully I never have to experience the uh, quietness of COVID again. And one of the great things that came out of this is my entire team, 100% of my team, except for one person that I had to let go. But the rest of the team is with me right now today. And we have had zero turnover which to me, that's my victory from this. I kind of remind myself of changing decades. I've always said that, you know, in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s and my 50s, there were always, I could think of the evolution of person, personality, leadership, all those things that happen if you're a good student and, you, and you're maturing and, and, and you're a good leader. 
things change. And it's interesting, if we look back two years now, every quarter of COVID, there was some kind of monumental something, if it was vaccine, if it was lockdowns, if it was, you know, businesses are slowly coming on board, the back orders on those stores. I mean, we couldn't find, we have cats, we couldn't find cat food for a long, long time. All those very interesting segments uh, of life that we went through for COVID. I mean, you know, wow, what did COVID teach me? Interesting. And I will openly say it was a very difficult time and it sucked a lot of money with it. Because like I said, we were too young for PPP money. And this may be a whole other podcast, but this was a a battle I had on a daily basis, Carm. You have your family, my three kids and my wife, and then I have my work family that I have to support. Which way was the, you know, your money comes down the chute and then it goes this way. Which way were you putting it? I mean, my wife is, uh, I can never thank her enough because she's even a more of a bulldog than I can ever be. And there were many conversations I had with her and I would say, hey, you know, Kathy, we are, um, I got to pull money out of the account to make payroll this week. And there was never a question. It was okay. She had blind faith. Or in one instance, we had a truck engine go down. And that's twenty twenty two thousand dollars right there to even get an engine put into a big truck, and that was one of the only things that was keeping us going is because construction had yet to slow down because a lot of that capital loan money had come in before COVID, and so right in the middle of COVID, I had to come home and tell my wife, "Hey, I'm going to yank twenty five grand out of our account and put it into a truck, or we could have sold the truck and walked away from it." Um, and broke even. It was certain things like that, that I really, you almost had to put, and and I know there are coaches and there are groups out there that will just come after me and lynch me when I say this. There are certain times in business you have to put money aside and you have to chase the dream of success and not the dollar quota every day. And there is a difference. And it's something I share with my team is, is, is money is not a goal. It's a byproduct of great, great service. That's what hurt a lot through COVID is I'm taking money from my family to fund my business and it's a gamble. And it goes back to a story that I think the industry has been telling itself for years about the rainy day fund. And what were they before COVID? Road closure, storms, flooding, those kind of natural disaster things, power grid stuff. Who would have ever thought of a pandemic? Thank God we're essential. It does teach us that in the case of ever this happening again, we've got to think about a three-month window of down and then up again. And again, I am not the expert. I'm just telling you what I continue to hear. And just my intuition and my common sense and my logic says, if you don't have three months worth of expenses and tack on another 20% for good measure, put away... So that you can keep those mouths fed that you that you need to feed family, family, business, family. Uh, you got to do it. What a great story, David. Thank you. David Eschbach, uh, Spirit One Automotive, uh, multi-shop operator out of St. Louis. Thank you, Carm. I appreciate it. Safe travels out there. And we look. For, I look forward to seeing you at one of the conventions or one of the many things that you're at. So. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.